Hi, everybody. Um, can everyone hear me? If you can just type on the side if you can. So, um, thank you for having me on today. I'm really honored to be asked by Dome Africa to give you some insight into hygiene protocols. Uh, and what I'm calling this, I know it, it said something like hygiene protocols uh, post uh, COVID-19 or post lockdown. But I don't think, you know, it's something that we need to stop doing even beyond um, stage one. And when many of us will be going back to work or some people already back at work, we are, um, you know, dealing with lots of other infections, lots of other uh, issues. And it's good to keep these good habits up. Uh, so I'm calling it enhanced workflow and hygiene protocols amidst COVID-19 and beyond. So thank you so much. It's a huge, huge topic. And I've also sent some documents and papers onto Yolandi. And I'll also send uh, on some to Adele. So afterwards they can distribute it. So it's they really, really nice to have a look at uh, some of the resources. So when you formulate your own hygiene protocols, uh, you have something to refer to. I'm going to put my screen off now, and then we're going to focus on just the slides. Okay, so that's it. Enhanced workflow and hygiene protocols amidst COVID-19 and beyond tips for aesthetic practices. I have a special interest in aesthetics. I am primarily a dentist, and um, if you know anything about dentists, you know, we're crazy about infection control. So we're absolutely <laughs> into um, wipes, sterilizers, uh, autoclave. So infection control is part and parcel of a dental practice. And I think from now on, it should be uh, more entrenched into aesthetic practices as well. Okay, so what are we currently dealing with here? So um, currently we're in the midst of this pandemic. It has taken over the world. It has shut down uh, economies. It has um, overloaded hospitals. And it's called, this is, well, the virus is called SARS, uh, a coronavirus 2. That's the name of the virus. And it stands for Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome, coronavirus 2. And then COVID-19, um, you often hear COVID-19, is the coronavirus disease. So uh, they're not the same thing. And all over the world, it's just known as corona. And is this thing out of the blue? Is, uh, is this pandemic out of the blue? And if you, you know, I know right at the beginning of lockdown, I think they released that movie, well, they replayed that movie, Contagion. And that was uh, dealing with the SARS-1 uh, virus when uh, that uh, broke out a, a bit more, uh, a bit more infectious and uh, higher mortality rates. And we've, we've been dealing, even in this country, with epidemics for many years, uh, multi-drug resistant HIV, I mean, multi-drug resistant TB, um, HIV. So we should have these good infection uh, control protocols um, 
already going. So, and in, in 2018, John Hopkins University uh, did a simulation and it's really creepy. You may think they, they've been taking notes from the Simpsons, but John Hopkins described a, a virus called Clade X. It was a complete simulation and they described how susceptible and unprepared the world is to a pandemic and even described it as a moderately contagious and moderately lethal virus. They described that it would be a respiratory, um, it would be like a respiratory virus, so it would be spread via coughing, and it would be infectious before symptoms appear, which is what is happening now. And they also noted during their simulation that RNA viruses are the biggest threats. So we've been pre-warned um, in terms of this pandemic. So again saying not our first pandemic and if there are no behavior changes in what we do this may not be our last pandemic and what have we been doing all this time have we been just nonchalant in our practices um, or in our clinics or even if you uh, i know some people go to spas and salons what have we been doing this time? And we've been dealing, uh, as you call it, a devil we know, multi-drug resistant TB. I mean, many of us have been vaccinated against um, TB. We've got a very good vaccination program in South Africa. HIV, which is now almost like, it's like a chronic uh, disease, almost like diabetes, if it is well treated and well handled. So there's, there's treatment for it, hepatitis, um, Hepatitis is, uh, you know, still out there and we have to be really, really good about our infection control, but many people and I, I think if you are going to be working with people so much, you should consider checking out your hepatitis B uh, teachers and maybe going for hepatitis B boosters. Uh, in terms of HIV, if you're a medical uh, practitioner, dental practitioner, uh, more than likely you've been, you've had a needle stick injury. And that is very scary, especially if the patient was positive, but because of the, um, the viral load that is needed for infection and that there's treatment available, it's, um, it's almost negligible uh, getting a needle stick if you do the proper protocol. And, um, I'll touch on the instrument cleaning later, but now this is this novel virus and even though there's so much effort and uh, energy and work going into it, there's still a lot we don't know, so it's important to err on the side of caution. What, what does the genome of, of SARS involve? So. Um, this virus, it is 96% bat um, coronavirus, 91 pangolin, 80% SARS, um, which was the first one, and then uh, the Middle Eastern respiratory uh, syndrome virus, 55%, also 50% um, uh, like cold influenza virus. It's an RNA virus, so technically it should have a low mutation, but they say they've already seen a mutation in this virus. I got this really cool slide from the Cyrus Institute video. Also, um, advise if you have time to go check them out on YouTube, very informative. So this is the character, characteristic infection progression in a single patient. And what this is basically showing is that you, you've been exposed as an incubation period, but two days before you are symptomatic, you are uh, infectious. And you also get uh, cases of patients that are asymptomatic that might also be infectious. And these are transmission routes. So it's widely uh, accepted that it is via droplet transmission. So droplets are these, um, well, droplets that are bigger than five microns that travel about two meters and then they drop to the ground uh, or they <clears throat> or they drop to surfaces and you get it via direct contact where you are touching it and then your hand goes to any mucosal membrane which would be your your uh, mouth your nose and hypothetically speaking also your eyes or that you wait as you know straight on droplet to the to the person where you cough literally in someone's face and indirect con contact where where you would maybe uh, sit on a seat uh, where someone was positive uh, sat. Then there's also, and we'll discuss it a bit later because there's a bit of a debate here about airborne or aerosol spread. So aerosols where the droplets are less than five microns. 
and it's it's a respiratory virus um, transmitted between people and what we've said here via respiratory droplets but this is when symptomatic people cough so with coughing people and all these large droplets more than five microns and then they drop two meters away so that's why this you know call it social or physical distancing is really important and that gravity is making them fall down but this figure but corona viruses have been studied since the 1930s so this figure is from the 1930s but depending on the airflow a droplet may uh, uh, travel further than that what about asymptomatic people and uh, what happens then? The, may this point to aerosol spread? So I'm going to discuss that in a little bit. And, and just to note, because it says their transmission route. So transmission does not always 100% mean infection. So you may have at the shops or in your practice already been with an asymptomatic patient and their uh, viral particles may have landed on you or you touched something at the shop. Uh, that had uh, viral particles and it's on your hand, it's been transmitted on your hand or on your clothes or wherever, but because you've washed your hands uh, and you did not touch any mucosal uh, membrane, you did not inoculate yourself with viral enough viral pa particles to cause an infection, you did not get infected. So we must just note the difference between transmission and infection. So here's the debate about aerosol. So people emit virus particles in a range of sizes, and some are tiny enough to be considered aerosols or super fine particles, so they're lighter than five microns. And um, there was a study, but this is not real life, right? So the study, which was published this year, March 17th, uh, in the New England Journal of Medicine, so they aerolized, they made like a fake, crazy aerolization of of very high viral particles and they showed that they were viable in the air for three hours but this was not real life uh, but if you think about aerolizing um, uh, viral particles think about i was watching a um a show the other day it was it was also <laughs> set in a very cold uh it was set in in china it was it was actually a travel blog show and while the woman was talking there was all this uh, water vapor escaping and if you remember when you kids we all love to do that just like breathe out and all this water vapor comes out or if you're breathing on your shield when you are uh, maybe your mask is on, on uh, as it should be and you will get that water vapor where, or when you fog up your glasses while wearing a mask or when you see these little spicules when you speak so you know there is that um, potential for aerialization of particles and there's something called a uh, super spreader event so there were two incidences the one which they did a study on was uh, choir singers in washington and there was one um, infected patient with um with uh, COVID-19, the patient was asymptomatic, but they were singing and singing, and um, for two hours they were in the same room. So even though, yes, it was transmitted, because of the time they spent together and all those viral particles, 45 uh, singers uh, <clears throat> Uh, got got sick from that, and then a restaurant in China. Uh, they were there was a, there was 83 people in the restaurant. It was on the third floor, and they had the aircon on, so the air wasn't still. And there was one person from Wuhan there that was actually symptomatic, and. Um, it it the the way this person it, the person next to the person didn't get sick we were strange enough but people on two other tables because of the aircon airflow uh, while the person was eating and talking actually became ill speaking loudly so you'll see in some of the protocols it says please do not speak loudly reduce speaking uh, your patients don't speak very much and also in a low tone um, also aerolizes particles hospital change rooms so this is important and we'll get to it is when you're changing in and out of your ppe so they found that uh, change rooms also because you're taking it out and then the particles get up in the air um, you also find aerolized uh, viruses <clears throat> in terms of dentistry so aerosol is 
the hot topic at the moment because in a lot of the world, dentistry is almost at a standstill. So there's some places, and we'll chat about that, that haven't locked down. They've almost, I wouldn't say carried on as normal, but with precaution, they've carried on even with aerosols. And they've taken these precautions with very low or to zero infection. So they pre-rinse and they, they use a pre-rinse. So if you're going to be working near the mouth, uh, I would recommend this, a pre-rinse and a nose swab because those areas are where uh, you you are having the virus transmitted, appropriate protective gear. So the shield, the mask, um, the gowns, and also if you're doing high, if you're doing something that creates an aerosol, and you 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 might think like, okay, I'm not working in that area, I'm not creating any water or anything, but laser, laser hair removal, um, laser skin treatments create a plume, and it's been found that in that plume, that aerosol there are viruses. So um, some, some laser devices do come with uh, built-in suction. And also now something called a high efficiency particulate air or HEPA air filters. So some aircon um, have that, but I wouldn't, you know, like if you've got like a central aircon feature, I wouldn't um, use it during this time. And now because of this pandemic, there's been loads of these plug in and play almost HEPA filters, a really good uh, air purification systems. And it does matter, it depends like, you know, if you own the building, is it your system or do you rent? So it's very nice and convenient to maybe consider one of these systems. Okay, and then the other way is contact transmission. So virus particles, uh, what I was talking about, the droplet transmission, <clears throat> Uh, get onto an infected surface, you touch the surface, then you touch your mucous membranes. And I'm sure everyone knows about the infamous diamond princess, all those poor people stuck on that cruise ship. And surfaces were found to have RNA material up to 17 days after contact with infected occupants. Um, and last night, I didn't read through it, uh, but I will send it on the, um, we received the report on St. Organs, Organs, Augustine, sorry, hospital, uh, the hospital in KwaZulu Natal, and they um, they put it down to formite transmission. What I'm talking about this contact transmission, formites are basically inanimate objects like uh, cardboard boxes, tables, all of those sort of things that can have viral particles on them. So from one patient, 125 infections and 15 deaths at that hospital. And what they're talking about is the importance of surface sterilization, stethoscopes, thermometers, um, and they in their study didn't find any evidence of aerosol. And then now people are always, you know, how long does this virus last? But this is under lab conditions, right? Uh, virus is viable on cardboard. So now you have to think about all the deliveries you will be getting through to your practice or through to your spa salon, cloth and wood uh, for 24 hours. Plastic and stainless steel for three and some studies say four days. Uh, a medical mask. That's the surgical mask for up to seven days. That's a bit scary. So it's important how you put it on and take it off and up to two days on glass. And the emphasis here when we're going to be talking about it is the importance of surface disinfection, uh, cleaning and wiping. And this is not only related to clin clinical areas, but also non-clinical areas such as reception and say a tea room. Disinfection choices. So. Uh, you know, I know there's been a huge spike in prices, especially of um, the 70% alcohol, but there's also the option of 0.1% uh, sodium hypochlorite, which is bleach, but can be corrosive. If you're dealing with blood, PR, PR, PRP, PRF, um, then I would uh, go with a 0.5%. 70% alcohol um, is standard with us, but you can go from 62% to 70% of alcohol in a spray in a wipe, 
0.5% of hydrogen peroxide. And you also put that in a, in a mouthwash. So just a note that the bleach and the hydrogen peroxide loses potency over time. So only mix what you need for the day. And something that a lot of us use, hypochlorous acid. So it's the GF spray, Micro Dyson, um, in the UK, they've got Clinicept, and there's loads of different brands out there, especially if you uh, research um, what's been going on. And it's an old method of disinfectant, but an effective method. And now more and more uh, in the dental setting, they're using it. So you can rinse or spray in the mouth, uh, your hands. Also, they have uh, surface disinfection options and fogging. We'll get to fogging, but that, that is also like a cold fogger uh, that people are using and sprays as well. So <clears throat> in terms of the mouthwash before seeing your patient. And they do, I think, you know, for me, uh, even though you tell the patient or you send your notes, please don't talk too much <laughs> during the appointment, it's almost impossible. So even if you're not working in the mouth, I would recommend that that is just a standard protocol, is that they have a 1% hydrogen peroxide mouth rinse, two parts water, one part hydrogen peroxide, or um, I know, I believe there's a, a commercially available povidine uh, mouth rinse, but if they are allergic to iodine, just be very careful. And I, I, I've i seen even people mix the two, the hydrogen peroxide with the povidine. And it's very important when you're using these disinfectants or already commercially prepared disinfectants like germicide wipes, cavicide, just to read what the contact time should be. So the, the disinfectant choices listed is one minute contact time, but sometimes it could be 10 minutes, like humans wipe and then wait for 10 minutes before um, you consider that disinfected. Spraying and cold fogging. So this is from the WHO document. It's only really, it's it's not like it, you, you couldn't, you shouldn't do it or don't do it, but oh, it's only if it's accompanied by wiping and cleaning before. Because if your surface is dirty, has dirt on it, or hasn't been properly disinfected, all that stuff you're spraying will be completely ineffective. And it's not, it's not supposed to be a primary disinfection method. Um, also, just to, you know, chlorine and um, these ammonium-based compounds can be really irritating to your eyes, your respiratory system, which you really don't want, and your skin. Um, spraying can also uh, redisperse the virus into the air, you know, especially if you haven't cleaned or wiped the area before. And we got these can foggers from one of the dental companies. I still haven't used them. I do have them. But um, just reading the reviews on, you know, in our little groups, our WhatsApp groups, uh, that <laughs> it was probably not a good idea to buy them about the respiratory irritants. Uh, issues and then trying to set one off. You're supposed to like technically then set one off in uh, in between each patient. There's also very much popularity around these spray tunnels and uh, I know the first one we saw is like in Europe, I think they were spraying a hydrogen peroxide solution onto people, but the World Health Organization does not recommend spray tunnels because they, well, they say it might be psychologically and physically traumatic, and it doesn't actually spread the, the like it prevents the spread of the virus from the individual. So if you're already positive and you spray it, it's not going to really help because you still, um, uh, you know, you're, you're still spreading your droplets and your, your aerosol from your breath and from your coughing, if you're coughing. It can also cause bronchospasm and coughing, which you don't really want, and nausea and vomiting. But many of the sprays, um, I think, are chlorine-based and also may have this, high, I see now the new thing is hypochlorous acid as a spray. Um, and then filtration. Um, you could have the HEPA filters that I was talking about. So, you know, along with your wiping, along with your proper disinfection, you could have that as perhaps an additional um, added benefit into your, into your practice. And when you're doing your disinfection, the space in between patients, you let the air purify and circulate. So there's also dry disinfection. So all those spraying and fogging is technically wet disinfection. And then uh, you see the same, right? The same uh, thing here is wipe and clean first. So even if you just do that uh, with correct disinfectants, you are covered. 
the entire UV spectrum can kill or act, inactivate many ma microorganisms. So even leaving something in the sun for a bit can also disinfect it. Uh, but the most um, germicidal effect is UVC energy at 253 and 0.7 nanometers. And if you look on the thing, UVC is 200 to 280 nanometers. But if you're thinking of getting one of these systems, you have to really, really research it and ask them lots of questions and be careful because ozone. What? But what about ozone? So there is also UVB light and they call it... Um, they call it UVC, but not exactly. And I'm not sure if this is the, the, the one in, you know, koi ponds and fish tanks, and you, you get those UVC bulbs, um, because UVC uh, devices also produce light at that wavelength, and they promote it as um, an added, in, you know, infection control protocol, but, and it does attack microorganisms. But and odors, but then it releases ozone, which is three uh, oxygen molecules. It's heavier than air, it sinks, and really importantly, it's a really bad respiratory irritant, which you also don't want um, at this time with COVID-19. Uh, it does, because it's so unstable, it does dissipate quite quickly. Uh, one of the um, OHS oral uh, occupational health um, officers were saying, you know, two to three minutes, but I am reluctant. Also, you have to be careful with UVC uh, not to get skin and eye exposure because it's um, UV light. So when you're doing it, the room has to be closed. You have to think of maybe an automated or time system, um, an infrared system where you can maybe switch it on with an app. So lots of things to think about if you're considering ozone and then you opt for the longer wavelength, of course. And then it's important the time, what is the bulb strength uh, because the stronger it is, the, the shorter the time. Are there shadows or hidden areas in the room and how big is your room, depending on how much of the UVC you need? What's really important at this time is that you have to be systematic. So you have to be meticulous, you have to be focused and aware. And, you know, we mustn't look at the lockdown levels as like, okay, it's number three, so it's okay out there. It's actually not okay. I think it was more okay during lockdown level five and I also work for the state so during that time I was uh, working and um, we were on high alert and you know I'm glad I did because it actually got me into a, a particular way of thinking and working but as the lockdown level increases the risk of spread increases because the economy is open up there's more people and as it has to um, and infections are increasing daily. So currently I am living in a metro that is a hotspot and I'm working in another which is very uh, close by that's also a hotspot. And um, infection control protocols and protection of yourself, your patients and your staff are super important. And I would say growing up, but uh, as a student in dentistry and then working here in the state and looking, you, you see the same thing every day and you take it for granted. So just to run you through the steps of an instrument being sterilized. So what happens is we full on have our things on in 95 masks and this has been for years having one of those um, Helyard N95s without the respirator because of TB. And the person washes the instrument in soapy, warm water, puts it in a cold sterilizer, like a cold sterilant liquid um, for an extended period of time, 20 minutes to an hour. And then it can go into an ultrasonic bath, but we hardly use that. But that is, you know, some, some people do use that. Then uh, dry it off, put in a pouch, seal, and then placed in an autoclave to be sterilized. And uh, it, it just blows my mind how I took that for granted. And when we were students, we went on this amazing train trip. It was called the Pella Pepper train. And it goes through all the rural areas. And we were in the Eastern Cape and they did all the stuff. And as an added on in the sterilization room um, overnight and in between uh, when you sterilize and you have to run out, of course, was a UVC in the sterilization room. And, <clears throat> you know, there's a lot of fear around what's happening, but I would encourage you to have a look. I can't say his name correctly, Dr. Marcus Trulch. He's a German dentist um, that has been working throughout 
uh, COVID. So in Germany, in Sweden, and in South Korea, there were no lockdowns. Things carried on as normal, but with extra um, caution in terms of social distancing, hand hygiene, wearing masks, and also like reducing patient flow and um, changing a few things in their offices. And there's a old, um, it's 20 years old, this, this, it's, it's a movement called Slow Dentistry by Dr. Miguel Stanley. And I advise you to go have a look, just Google his name and a video will come up about their protocol during this time, which isn't very much different from what they used to do before. But the whole movement is based on seeing one patient, doing the proper work on one patient and having enough time between these patients to properly disinfect your, your area. AMSA, um, our AMSA body in this country, also has some very nice thorough guidelines and I can also send that on. Importantly is to be prepared. So some of us are already working and some places still have to open up. So you have to think about what are you going to do before you open. And it's important because they are difficult to get. And um, I had a, a lot of the stuff actually before lockdown and we had a lot of the things just normally, especially disinfectants, some gowns, things like that. But to source your PPE now, uh, investigate those sneeze screens. If you rent in an, uh, a place, you can get a stand-up freestanding uh, sneeze screen pretty easily. Um, staff training. So always keeping in touch with each other, updating yourself. And you literally have to speak every day about about this until it becomes normal to you, uh, keeping in touch with patients. So, you you know, it's very difficult. Um, you know, I think people just went into a bit of a shock, but it's important to keep in touch with your patients as well as, your, you know, if you've got clients, your clients, and declutter the office. Take away all the junk. Uh, you know, some people have really, well, like, you know, you have nice ornaments, you have nice things, but you have to uh, get rid of them for now, uh, reduce whatever's in the tray, and then only take out what you need. Um, do as many things as you can do online. So uh, consultations, virtual consultations, they're actually really nice and convenient. I've done a few and I must say I'm current, it's, it is enjoyable and they, they are super easy to to do. Uh, nothing beats obviously a face to face, but yeah, and um, sending through products. Think of a drive through product concept where uh, people WhatsApp you the order, they can pay before, and you have it ready and bam, in their car if they don't want the career option because people are saving money on career fees. And then you have to also, this is before you open, what to do when the patient is there, check in, treatment, what does the patient need to wear, and then also. Um, what to do when uh, you uh, when they leave, and you have to think about your office modifications. Like I'm talking, the sneeze guard, the sanitizer station, the waiting room, and if you've got space, even a a room where you can put on and take off your PPE. So that's really important: donning and doffing your PPE. So, <clears throat> So you could do everything right in terms of infection control, but if you take the stuff off or put it on incorrectly, you could also, the viral, if there are any viral particles on you, can just up in the air and you can breathe it in. So N95 mask. So if you have one with a respirator, just note that that does not protect your patient. So if you can wear a surgical mask over that, and a note on the surgical mask. When you're wearing a surgical mask, it's not for your protection, it's actually for the patient's protection. So I know some people actually double mask and wear it the blue side out, the waterproof side out, and then reverse the mask over that. So you almost have double protection, like protection for you and protection for the patient. Uh, they are, you, it's very difficult to get N95s at the moment. And there is, if you have any 3M um, N95s, I uh, believe is that 100% of them are currently counterfeit. When it was saying, you know, they're 3M, it's, it's not really. And now there's this modified KN95 uh, mask, but you also have to be careful. So if you have a mask, like if you look at the lady in the picture, uh, that those are head loops. So, you know, the whole thing about an N95 mask, it fits your face way better than a surgical mask would. And, uh, and it can, 
it's, it's wrapped, it's secure over your head. But a lot of these K95 masks, or if they're fake for real, have ear loops, so uh, might not fit your face um, properly. Because there's a shortage of these masks, they have been, um, you can, I, I wouldn't, but you can recycle them. So you use one every third day, you put put it in a paper bag and leave it in the sun or a hydrogen peroxide fogger. So you make a, it's like a box where you fog hydrogen peroxide over the mask overnight. And then again, the separate room and uh, change the mask for the patient. Another thing is this really fancy mask, cloth mask out there, also with respirators. I, um, I, like if the patient has one, uh, you, you'd rather have them have a proper, you know, surgical mask on, you give it to them, because then you're not really protected. Okay, as a practice as far, just to uh, constantly update yourself and um, you, yes, it's, it's very, it's a very, so just to keep calm and be kind, because it is a stressful situation, especially if you're not used to, used to it, and um, it's just to throw away egos and not get offended, because this is for each other's safety, but the way you say things, also just be kind when you say things, uh, not everyone is always on the same page page and appropriate uh, PPE. So this is what my staff wears. It depends on you. And there's also a sneeze shield, I think, <laughs> you know, I'm just extra. But why is there a sneeze shield is that um, sometimes uh, my receptionist and also the staff is very much reduced. It's just basically my receptionist and I. Um, goggles, shield, mop cap gown, mask, and those um, disposable shoes. So it's not a strictly aerosol generating. I mean, she has all this stuff on, but she's also still speaking to patients. And um, you must also remember to disinfect the area after each patient and disinfect the sneeze guard and access to hand washing facilities. Everything must be there as well as a sanitize, uh, sanitizer station and to keep disinfectant wipes at the uh, reception desk. It's important to have mask breaks. So with the surgical mask, you can still breathe a bit, but with the, and if it's not a non-respirator N95, or even a cloth mask, it's really, you can't breathe um, well often. And it is very disturbing. You can get hypoxia and uh, lots of CO2 emission. I would say have a breathe break, go, go out and breathe in the fresh air far away from everyone else. Uh, one thing I, I, I think is also important is to get your waste segregation in order if you don't have that. So you have a bin. So here it's pretty normal. A bin, a red bag for biomedical waste, like the gloves, the gauze, the things with blood on if you're doing any injections, and a sharps container. And I've been to, I've been to a few aesthetic trainings where there is no red bin. Um, and it's just the bin, and that is not okay. <clears throat> so even your PPE must go into a red bag. What we've done is we've got like uh, like separate bins for the staff, and then a separate bin for the PPE. And what is the aim now? So now you you having um, people come in. So the aim is not to have anyone that is ill, like patient wise, or that has been in contact with a post positive COVID case to come into your office at all. So a lot of this, uh, the, the the stuff is done over um, over the phone and digitally. I'm sorry, I think someone's mic is on. <laughs> uh, there are asymptomatic cases and therefore our guard must be always up. So we have to treat each case as positive um, and then encourage EFT patient, uh, payments and virtual consultations and uh, forms to be sent over email and digital uh, platforms. So try like make sure even if it's just a Word document that it's able to be edited because a lot of patients don't actually have um, printers and then you send the stuff there's so much stuff to read I think it's important that you phone and message them and remind them about the changes remind them about the, the questionnaires because uh, people will come in uh, not having read anything there's something called telephone triage we'll go through and screening so as staff and yourself you must also be screened um, twice a day morning and afternoon uh you you know it's so sad but you have to reduce the stuff like not obviously they go and stuff but reduce the stuff so you have to maybe if especially if your staff are you know we we miss uh, one of our ladies so much she's pregnant 
but because she's pregnant for this time she has to stay at home but uh, and if your staff are over 60 have any comorbidities they will have to maybe safely stay at home because you are dealing with patients or stagger your staff if you you know if you don't need everyone there at the same time um, like I'm saying, vulnerable staff stay at home and you may have to have changed or reduced hours. Some clinics are only working two or three times a week. Some have reduced their time. And then important to have a patient register for tracking as well as a screening record. And this is something that you have to emphasize to your patients is um, punctuality. So I, I know we all have issues with, with this, but this is super important because you know, you, you set up for something and then also you have a limited amount of time uh, to adequately disinfect after the patients. Reduce, this is reduce unnecessary contact and time. And it's very, it's a different mindset that we have to get used to for just this time. Um, you, because it's a very social environment when people come for an aesthetic treatment. The patients talk a lot and it's not only about the treatment, it's the whole psychology of it. So um, it is a bit of a change, but try and do some things virtually, I still try and keep in touch with the patient. And, you know, it's for, it's for now. And a lot of these practices will still say, especially the enhanced infection control practices, but it's, this sort of not being um, social won't be here forever. So there, there'll be a time where we can almost get back to normal, but with enhanced infection control. So it's just a bit on the telephone triage and as well as uh, prepping uh, the area. Let me just go through this, sorry. So you like preparing patients. So it's important to communicate with the patient. So like I said, besides sending um, those documents through whatever you've prepared, like your um, COVID uh, consent form, which you need to have, the questions, it's important to also physically, well, not physically, but over the phone, speak to patients as well as message them, I, like communicate with them as much as possible. Um, and then in terms of the telephone trial, just like it's almost like a screening tool. So good morning, Danny. Danny is my receptionist. I'm going to ask you a few brief questions. And this is just a safety precaution. And we ask every patient just to make sure no person with symptoms enters our practice. People get easily offended. So it's important to explain yourself to patients. And then you ask them a series of questions like, have you had a feed in the last 14 days? Um, I can send this on, but I'll, I'll go through it. A cough, sore throat, shortness of breath, or any respiratory symptoms in the last 14 days? diarrhea, digestive upsets, loss of a sense of taste, and any new skin condition. So on your toes um, or your hands. And then are you socially or staying at home with someone that has been uh, suspected or confirmed uh, positive or have you tested positive? You have to ask that. I know it sounds like a silly question, but you do have to ask that. And once they say no, you can say, that's great to hear with you at nine. Please don't come in until we text or call you, but people still come in. So just be prepared for it. In light of the current events, we have a new check-in and it's pretty quick. Um, and hopefully they've signed everything they need to sign beforehand. And if not, keep it ready. They must use their own pen. If they don't use their own pen, either you know, buy a whole lot of pens, they can take it with them or disinfect thoroughly. And um, if you want to, you can walk it through with them when they arrive, or you can tell them ahead if they've got if they've got time. Okay, so once the patient is in the practice and you've adequately prepared the practice, so just to remember now, um, and I'll get to that, that the, I wouldn't say the waiting room is now obsolete. It's, it's so important, but um, you limit the, the points of entry to your practice and don't have people in the waiting room. Um, and then if, if they arrive early, some people like to, they, they stay in the car, but what's important is, and you communicate it to them before, that they leave their bags and everything in the car. Um, if they're not feeling well, they should just let you know and, and cancel their appointment, jewelries, watches, keys, all of that in a Ziploc bag. Some of them don't bring it, so have some Ziploc bags handy and also keep your stuff in a, in a Ziploc bag. Uh, sometimes like, you know, people are paranoid, they'll arrive with, um, with, with gloves and um, they should remove the gloves and discard in your red box. 
also the mask so they might arrive with their masks and if it's a if it's like a surgical mask i'd also have them discard it before treatment it's a cloth mask give them a ziploc bag if they don't have one and they must put it in there but when they leave because you've been touching their face and all of that um give them a new surgical mask sorry <coughs> Okay, so no mask, no entry. That's the sign at our door. Um, and also you can have additional things on the sign, but be kind, make it colorful. Uh, if you'll advise not to enter, um, have, the, have the necessary numbers to con uh, um, contact and have your patient kit ready. So we have our kit ready, which is the mask, the boots, the gown and the cap and um, encourage the patient, even though they don't always all stay in the car, uh, to stay in. <clears throat> When the patient comes in, they either wash their hands in the in the bathroom and they dry uh, with a disposable paper towel, or we have a sanitizing station and we have sanitizer spray in case they go past the foot control sanitizing station. They get their temperature checked and then they are recorded. Um, the options in terms of the, well, we have booties, but they are other options, you know, some doctors uh, have them leave their shoes outside. Um, some people have disposable slippers, so uh, they leave their shoes outside and then give them like clean new slippers that they go home with. Um, and it's just it's just going that we we count the patient and what I was talking about with the uh, with the mask. And it's important that with the PPE, every patient. New patient, you throw that stuff away. So, and you also put on new PPE. Uh, keep your mouth uh, rinsed ready. And again, I was just speaking to someone yesterday, a patient. But you know, you have your shield on and, and everything. So try and discourage treat, uh, speaking during treatment because their mask will be off. Um, and just again, uh, talking about the aerosol. And um, if you can keep their mask on, so it's an upper face treatment. Please do. And have the have the checkout a really streamlined. So sometimes they might be with an EFT there, or or, if, or you instead of making a follow up visit, like uh, you can say you will call them for follow up, and especially if it's not. Um, treatments that may require strict follow-up. Uh, you can phone them, say in 10 days, or we always check our patients the next day anyway, and see if it's necessary for them to physically come in for a touch-up or, or follow-up. A lot of the patients should be fine. And uh, also they must leave with a new mask because you tell them not to wear makeup, but a lot of them do wear makeup and it's on the old it's on the old mask and like I've said you've worked and you've disinfected the face and you don't want anything happening to um, anything you've done on the face so, and like, like I've said now the waiting room has changed its function one day it'll get its function back maybe uh, but it's no longer for waiting so you can even I, I think some people have actually removed the chairs uh, or you leave one or two chairs but you leave them very spaced out. It's just a passing point from the outside to the inside of the practice. Its main role is screening as the screening was described and we'll also send you the screening. And um, it's not to sit in the waiting room unless you know you people need to sign that COVID form that they didn't fill in digitally and if the fever is high and they didn't tell you. Uh, so not not for them to pass into the practice and just remember no max in the practice and importantly um, we're reducing patients at this time so no more for now you know peel days and injectable days and those sort of things patient events unfortunately uh, you know, for the time being, no patient events. So one room in use and one room completely disinfected, wiped, uh, cleaned and sanitized. And then um, in terms of this doffing sequence, uh, that's really important. So once your your treatment is, is done, so um, you take off your booties, you actually take off your gloves and then you take off your booties. But if your gown is tied uh, in the front, you have to leave your um, gloves on because the front is disinfected. But a lot of the gowns are back tie gowns. So 
off with all of that and then the gowns often like almost fall off you and then you touch the inside only of the gown not the contaminated part don't worry i'll send through pictures of this and there's lots of videos to watch on how this is done and that's rolled up really tightly and placed in the red bag then your your visor your goggles your cap and then <clears throat> A lot of places also have another ribbon outside because there's all this you've been taking off your your gown and 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 all of that um, uh, particles viral particles might be in the air you might still have to disinfect the room so it's important to take your mask out when you are outside the room and don't touch the front of your mask take it off from uh, behind your ears from the elastics and disinfection of all surfaces and from cleanest to most dirty and don't forget the actual sanitizing bottles the door handles the floor all the bottles and things that you were using um, you know that might, may get neglected uh, the room must be ventilated and at least 15 minutes between patients after uh, cleaning this is what I wear. I wear an N95. I wear my shield, goggles, scrubs underneath. Um, I also have this waterproof material suit that I had sewn, which is pretty comfortable and it's nice now that winter's coming up. A disposable gown, especially for things like PRF, PRP, but I've just started wearing the disposable gown anyway. Caps and boots. It might seem uh, excessive, but I think it's better to err on the, on the side of caution, like I've said. Okay, before we get to delivery of, oh no, my screen went, okay. Before we get to delivery of packages, I just wanna go over to see if there is anything um, that I may have uh, missed. So, you know, I don't have, I should have shown you a picture, but we're so used to in our, in our environment to make it really comfortable and almost spa-like for the patient. But now we have to be really, really good about infection control. So that means no linen on the bed. If there is linen on the bed, you have to change it with every single person and if possible to launder it there at your, at your practice or at your uh, salon or spa at 60 degrees. If you can keep the bed, uh, the treatment bed completely clear, you can have linen savers that are disposable and um, uh, and and you know wipe down the bed and so your 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 timing your timing i know we're saying patients should be functional but we must also be functional and uh, be really good about our our time so we don't keep patients waiting in the waiting room um and then if the patient has to under so some of the body treatments uh they'll have to take off their clothes maybe if you can provide a bag for those clothes um as well or a hanger that can be disinfected uh afterwards <clears throat> and then <clears throat> in terms of cleaning I'll, i think i'll get to that in terms of cleaning the practice and a really good video to watch would be the, uh, dr miguel stanley every half an hour they do surface disinfection. Whether there's a patient there or not, so they get into the rhythm of it, and then you tick off um, what you uh, what you what you've cleaned and where you've cleaned. So you can um, you can identify if there's anything that's been missed. So we're also getting a lot of delivery of packages at this time since people have been open. A lot of people coming in, they must also get screened as a patient gets get screened and the hands disinfected, they must be wearing a mask. No mask, no entry for them either. And with the um, cardboard uh, boxes also disinfect. Disinfect the delivery is like in the box as well. So you just wipe it down uh, in re reception after delivery and place it where you will disinfect that surface. So don't put it on a chair or, or anything like that where it's difficult to um, disinfect. Okay, yeah, so, so something like this. You can make up a little table like this as well. So I wear like a standard PPE for each procedure, whether it's aerosol or no aerosol, uh, but procedures should determine PPE. And right now there is a shortage. It is a cost factor. So uh, I was watching a webinar about going back to practice and what to do before. And they were even talking pricing. What should you do? And I know it's tempting to do specials and things like that, but you shouldn't uh, do excessive specials because you don't want to have like a rush of people <laughs> coming through. Uh, you have to space people. We're not also allowed to do specials. You, you're supposed to um, uh, 
space people appropriately. And besides this, all these um, these protocols and all these things that you are um, starting to do um, is is besides money is also time. So um, think about what you're doing and don't compromise on your safety or patient safety and your staff safety. Um, in terms of <clears throat> aerosol generating procedures, this is my personal view, even though, um, uh, you know, if you listen to that uh, doctor, that Dr. Marcus in Germany, they carried on almost like normal, but with unbelievable disinfection as well as um, uh, the appropriate PPE and they had no cluster infection, no infections at all actually from the from the dental clinic. Um, I, if it's not necessary, uh, maybe not to do aerosol generating procedures at this time, especially if you don't have all the PPE requirements. Um, and then someone was asking me, uh, because there's lots of cool gadgets that you can buy. There's one that even looks like a plunger pump. Uh, and it's like an external suction, not a high volume suction close to the laser plume or wherever aerosol is coming out. It's almost like a bowl. And that actually might not be that good because it's sucking the aerosol away from the source and dispersing it further. So when you're looking at things to buy, research thoroughly before you add anything onto your um, onto to your practice and just getting back to this Dr. Marcus and they it was a professor Vihan who was saying you know when he first started there even though it was high risk with all this water and stuff in a dental practice because of the infection control protocols um, and the, the PPE that was generally used there were no in, uh, no infections early on and a lot of the infections were uh, they got were socially or when they went to the shops you know like outside their practices versus in a hospital setting like if you think of going to the hospital uh, before all of this and even if you went to an ICU ward or visited someone there how many nurses would be wearing masks <laughs> hardly any you know so they weren't protecting each other um, so it's something to think about. Okay, getting home safely. So everyone's worried, you know, um, daily worry every day. You know, you for me, I miss just coming home and randomly hugging my children. Even, even though I worked in a high-risk environment and I probably had all this gunk uh, on me, thinking, you know, what, uh, what was I doing? What was I doing before? So if you can shower and laundry and all of that at work, uh, please do so. But <clears throat> if not, when you get home, you leave your shoes at the entrance. The <laughs> first couple of days, I think people were even undressing outside. Uh, but now you just leave your shoes at the entrance, you disinfect your keys, your phone, your phone needs constant disinfection. It is a really dirty surface and leave aside in one spot. Um, often when I come home, I spray my face with GF and it's actually a really good idea to do even when you are in practice. Like, if you have hypochlorous acid and when you're changing out of your PPE, also to spray your face um, with GF. Uh, I take off my clothes and immediately in the washing machine and uh, we advise to wash it at 60 degrees Celsius. The setting there, I know most washing machines are for allergens um, and you can double wash if you want. Wash hands and shower. And then I'm saying there, rinse, lather, repeat, which basically means eventually you become so used to it. Just the way we uh, wash the instruments, sterilize the instruments, put it in the pouch. You know, you think, oh, that's such overkill. But because you do it every day, eventually this should become uh, normal. And I think for, for this, what should stay are these good infection control measures, uh, sensible infection control measures and safe ones, you know, wiping down um, a real value to to patient care and like time. So we all, you know, I even during this time, I'm learning so much. And then what I do miss, though, is that that nice interaction and patients having a cup of tea at the practice. We will eventually get up uh, back to that, I think, I know. Uh, but I'm, I'm glad we've also been, um, uh, you know, I don't know how to say, like, you know, it's almost like a wake up call, that, uh, whatever were we doing before? And um, let's see how much better we can do things now, even though it's uncertain and a bit scary sometimes. And that, that is my um, 
my uh, presentation. I'm not sure if there are any questions. I'm going to go check it out now. I don't know how to unshare my screen. Stop share. There we go. Dr. Bana, I can, I can quickly go through some of the questions that came through. Um, Olga asked, will normal UVC light produce ozone? Uh, yes. So, sorry, I can't see. Is it okay if I, I can't really see the questions? That's fine. Um, I'll quickly read them to you. Okay. All right. Hi, Olga. So, the normal UVC light does. So, those... Um, those, when, you, when you're thinking of buying UVC, uh, if you have a look at the, um, what's the word, the wavelengths, ask them, you know, is it between this and this wavelength? I think if I have to, let me just go back to my screen. Um, share. It's between 200 and, let me just get there. Because a lot of the time, between 200 and 280 nanometers. So if it's between that, uh, then it is, they call it far UVC. So it still has those uh, germicidal um, properties without uh, releasing ozone. But then they are selling um, UVC lights between 100 and 200 nanometers. That they, it is UVC basically, but at that at that um, wavelength, it, um, it produces ozone. That does dissipate, but then, you know, it's a respiratory irritant and uh, you have to keep the door closed. When you open the door, there's all that ozone, which you can smell. I think long-term, you know, you have to think long-term. I don't think um, to get that sort of UVC is a good idea. So it might cost a little more, uh, but to get like, um, you know, um, a UVC between 200 and 280 nanometers. Yeah, because I, I already purchased and tomorrow they're going to be installed. Um, it's why, yeah, I probably so, you know what? to replace I them after I'm something. Also having, oh, sorry, Olga. I, I'm also having one made. I'm just going to check it out first. But uh, something you can maybe think of doing with the ozone is you do have these plug and play sort of... Um, air purification systems. You know, I've been looking at Dyson. There's one from a company called Wright Milner's for Radic 8. Um, there is a, something from Sci Vision that's about uh, 16,000 Rand, I think. Oh, yeah. yeah I one from this Wright thing. Milner's is about 38, but it's an air purification system that you don't have mm. to, you know, mm. connect to your central air. It's, it's, you, it's like a plug-in sort of. Uh, it, you might you might uh, think of that. The other option is if you, with the UVC is um, you, you, you um, especially if no one's going to be passing the window, you close the blinds and you leave the windows open when the UVC is working and then don't go in the room for maybe a good five minutes, even after, like after the UV cycle so the ozone can dissipate. Okay, uh, basically ozone will disappear quite quickly, right? Yes. Okay, then okay, then it's fine because uh, it's going to be installed tomorrow. I don't have windows in the rooms too. And this was my worry already previously, but I couldn't find mm. the answer. Thank you for giving me answer. And yeah, basically if we put, let's say for 20 minutes UVC and uh, in between each client and uh, then 10 minutes we're not walking in, then it should be fine, right? Yes, yes. Mm. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks. My pleasure. Okay, Dr. Bana, then I think Aisha said exactly what you said now, that the far UVC is more expensive but safer with contact on the skin. Um, so I think that's exactly what you said just now. And then we've just got one more question, and that was from Nicola, who said, can you send the list you asked them to sign? and symptoms through please for signs and symptoms i think you said oh that sure yeah i'll send that i'll send that through like um like the checklist yes i think like that's the, the one you yes, yes no to. problem okay and then any recommendations where to get the disposable gowns that you were talking about so you anywhere everywhere <laughs> <laughs> so there's lots of companies. Um, I'll, I've got an. I'll just have to look for it. 
um, on, on my phone. So there's a, a factory that's, I think, in Kempton Park, they're making. And, but I get them personally from a dental company. So I can give you the details of the dental companies. Uh, there's Wright Milner's and there's one called Euro Dental. Um, I'm not sure, but I believe Conquest Surgical is also doing some PPE. But the, the companies that I've, I've been buying my gowns from currently are Wright Milner's uh, Dental in Madrid and Euro Dental. I'll just, I'll have, to, I'll, I'll have to send on the context to Yolandi. Thank you. I see um, Sherry said that SA distributors um, also sell them. So I think we'll, we'll definitely be able to. to yeah, to there's lots, there's the, lots yeah. of uh, places getting them. And then I had, uh, but you know, I don't, I wear disposable over it, but I also had some sewn um, as well. Um, but yeah, sure, there's, there's, um, it's everywhere now. I think because because the economy was closed, a lot of businesses then had to go into that uh, yeah. work. But the, the, there is a disparity of prices and availability. So if you can like, like buy a reasonable amount, and you know you have to just make do buying different kinds, um, like different suits wherever you can get can get them. And yeah, some of the prices are crazy, but between. Um, I think there used to be like eight rand a gown or something, and now I think the most um, inexpensive would be 55 rand, which I've seen, uh, but on average about 80 rand a gown. Yeah. yeah. Some I gowns so. are able to be disinfected in an autoclave, like, or uh, on, a, you, they've got these big autoclaves, they call B class, um, where you can uh, autoclave like cotton wool and stuff, so on that a B cycle, but most are, I think I'd rather dispose of, <laughs> dispose of yeah. them. Yeah. yeah. And there's also like some people, I've seen some people, if, especially if it's on high risk work or maybe it's a toxin, uh, you can maybe think about wearing a plastic apron over, um, over your gown. Uh, if you have laundry services or laundry um, at your practice, then I would say a nice option would be to, I've actually seen it that you can, you can buy them, are washable gowns, but then also to take them off nicely and uh, take them off between each patient, make a whole lot of these washable gowns and then uh, launder it at your practice. Mm. It's also a good option, yes. Mm. Dr. Barna, thank you so much. I see there's no other questions coming through. We do appreciate it. It was very interesting and I think a lot of things for us to consider as well. Um, but yeah, as you said, this is going to be the new normal for us. So um, we're going to have to, to um, change the way we think about how we get that luxurious feeling for our clients in our no. clinics. It's not going to be the <laughs> same be creative anymore, now. Hey? Yeah. <laughs> thank you so much. I do appreciate and thank you to everyone that that listened and joined us for this um, webinar we will definitely make sure that you all get the recording by tomorrow and then i will also forward those um, reference documents that dr barna did send me and also the checklist that uh, that i will get from her and then also forward it to everyone on the list okay, okay. Thank, thank you dr barna thank you so much thank you bye-bye bye, -bye. bye.